we figured out, well, more or less, last week about the mechanism of translation. And actually, we kind of walked ourselves through the entire process of gene expression. DNA is transcribed into mRNA, and mRNA is translated into proteins. We've also highlighted some differences between pro and eukaryotic gene expression. In this, now I want to summarize them. You know, what are the big differences? Because I tell this to pretty much every, um, every class. Uh, we could talk about all different transcription and translation factors that regulate each process. And we can talk about this and that acronym like EIF2 alpha, EIF4, um, role, roles of GTPases in the translation in eukaryotes. But the problem is, if we will do that, we will lose the forest behind the trees. Okay? And I want you to see the forest. I want you to understand the fundamental concept because if you know how it works, you will be able to dig deeper if you need to. Does that make sense? Does it? Okay. So let's see what are the major differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And you know them all. So eukaryotes are on the left from you. And first of all, in eukaryotes, transcription and translation are separated physically in space. Unlike in prokaryotes. Remember that in prokaryotes, transcription and translation happen virtually at the same time. Once mRNA emerges from the polymerase molecule, ribosomes bind to it right away, quite immediately, and start to produce protein. There's a misnomer here. It's not DNA, of course. It's a protein. Okay. Ribosomes start to produce protein even though mRNA molecule is not synthesized completely. It's still in the process. Okay. Uh, would you remind me what it's kind of two sides of the same coin. What allows prokaryotic organisms to have transcription and translation? It's a continuous process. And what prevents eukaryotes from having those two processes at the same time? Why eukaryotes cannot? Huh? Yes, they have to move it from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. That's one thing, right? Because if you look at the, at the, at the illustration here, the RNA has to be transported into the cytoplasm for translation. Transcription and translation are specially separated, right? And because of that, they are separated temporally in time. Another big difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes that in prokaryotic organisms, right here, mRNA does not have to be processed. Once DNA, once the gene is transcribed, mRNA is ready for translation. That allows that immediacy. You see, that permits ribosomes to start translation immediately after mRNA transcript comes out of the uh, RNA polymerase. To the contrary, in, in eukaryotes, mRNA has to be massively processed. First of all, well, it has to be spliced, remember? Introns have to be cut out and exons have to be stitched together. Second, mRNA in eukaryotes have to get the poly A tail to be successfully transported from the nucleus and it's got to have a cap structure. So it's called RNA is capped. Does anyone remember what is the function of the 5 prime 
cap on the eukaryotic mRNA. It's a signal for something to bind and start translation. Protein is the product of translation. What makes protein? Which organelle? Ribosomes. So it's a binding signal for the ribosomes. Right? The third difference, big difference, is the structure of the transcript. Structure of the mRNA. That, well, that's that's bad, bad choice of words, sorry. It's how many genes are in the mRNA. Turns out that when bacteria do transcription, they may transcribe several genes into one mRNA. Does that make sense? Like you have three different books all together in one volume. Okay? Gene 1, gene 2, and gene 3. Is that understood? It's one mRNA. This mRNA will be translated into three separate proteins, but so far, those genes are parts of the same mRNA. This is called polycystronic mRNA. One transcript, several genes. Okay? <clears throat> In eukaryotes, mRNA is always monocystronic, which means one transcript, one gene. Yes? So, from periods, what does it use to decide where it should start and stop? You said the eukaryotes has the cap? Yes. On the ribosome? Yes. What would In prokaryotes, the site of recognition for the ribosome is so called shine. Dalgarno sequence. I quickly mention it here. So it's a it's different. It's a specific structure in RNA that uh, assumes a shape that ribosome can recognize. Good. That answer. Do you understand the difference between mono and polycystronic mRNA? Okay. Well, ribosomes are different. Um, eukaryotic one is bigger, they have slightly different structure, and that difference in structure actually allows us to produce, as I mentioned before, antimicrobials, the target bacterial ribosome. It's actually kind of interesting. <laughs> when we'll get to the antimicrobials, you will see. It goes, okay, penicillin, well, a little bit of this, a little bit of that inhibition, and then a ton of antimicrobials that mess up mess up the, the protein synthesis. Okay. Another um, feature of eukaryotes is that they often have to modify proteins that are produced as the result of translation. I'm not looking at my watch, I had it sound problem yesterday, so now I'm all paranoid about it. Um, which means, when protein comes out of the ribosome, when it's just synthesized, it's not ready to perform its function, something has to happen to it. It may be cleavage, so the protein is cut. Okay, It may be adding um, chemical residues, like um, phosphate residue, for example or even the entire chain of carbohydrates, okay? In some cases, another protein is added to the protein itself. For instance, uh, there are processes that are called simulation and ubiquitination. I, to save my life, I won't recall what simulation does. Ubiquitination is a fascinating process. If the protein that just was synthesized is bad. Okay, it doesn't have the proper structure. 
which means it doesn't have a proper function, it will be labeled for degradation. Special tiny proteins called ubiquitins will bind to the faulty protein and direct it um, to be destroyed. It's like a not the quality label, but anti-quality label. Does that make sense? Okay. Now this slide, I found this this picture on the internet. I acknowledge the author in the right bottom corner. If you want, you can go on the page of that of gentleman. He's a professor. I don't remember which university, but <coughs> this is a really nice flow chart that you can use for the review purposes. So if you can walk yourself through this chart, okay, or you can redraw it by yourself, that's great. It means that you understand what's going on there. Okay, so the upper portion right here refers to prokaryotes. You see that the gene is transcribed into the mRNA, which is then translated into protein. Okay? And that's simple. That's prokaryotic model. Does that make sense? Okay. Gene may or may not have certain regulatory elements, which we will talk about timely. Okay. Now in eukaryotes, it's slightly more complicated. Most of them do have regulatory sequences. Genes have introns and exons. So the primary transcript here is not ready for translation. It has to be spliced. It has to be processed. And only after processing it can be translated and the protein will be synthesized. Fairly rarely, proteins are ready to go and perform the function. They have to be modified post-translationally. Addition of various small and large residues. Does that make sense, that my walkthrough? Okay. Now this part, don't worry about it. We just don't talk about it. Now, I told you that post-translational modifications occur mostly in eukaryotes. It doesn't mean that they never happen in prokaryotes, but they are uncharacteristic for prokaryotic organisms. Does that make sense? So, I mean, if, if you see the, some, one of the answers to the question, post-translational modifications never in prokaryotes. That's not true. Okay, they're rare, but they do occur. Clear? Good? Let's move on. That's... When we started this chapter, I mentioned that there's going to be a lot of abstract concepts. And that's probably the most abstract of the mole, it's DNA replication. What is DNA replication? Can anyone tell me? What happens during DNA replication? Huh? Say again? Well, DNA replication accompanies cell division. Why DNA replication is required for the successful cell division? To do what? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. To copy, copy the genes to bring the information into the new cell. To make sure that genetic information is inherited. Okay, that daughter cell has all the genes that mother cell has. Right? Now, replication and, ex and gene expression. Do they have anything in common? I mean, okay, let me put it this way. Replication, does it have to do anything with a gene expression? Not really, no. No. In this case, it's just copying the genes. Now, when 
Genes are expressed. Genome contains a, contains a lot of genes, right? Are all of them expressed at the same time? No, it's just some of them. What about replication? Are all genes copied? Yes. The entire chromosome, the entire genome is copied in one act of DNA replication. Does that make sense? Right? It's like uh, printing a book and reading a book. When you print a book of short stories, um, you kind of want to print the entire book. You're not just saying, ah, you know, I'm going to, here I'm going to print pages 1 to 15, here 25 to 73. Okay? You reprint the entire book. But when you read from that book, you don't have to read the entire thing. Just, you can read just a part of it. Does that make sense? So that's one important thing. Mechanism, the basic, very basic concept is awfully simple. DNA that exists in the form of double strand, right? It's a double strand right here. It unzips. The so-called origin of replication. Okay. And special enzymes called DNA polymerases start to copy. Each enzyme copies its own strand. Okay. They copy it based on the complementarity feature. So if if original strand has A, the new strand has T, and so on and so forth, right? And you end up with two double strand molecules of the DNA. Okay? Make sense so far? Okay, good. So if you look at this, you will see that each strand actually possesses the entire genome, the, the all genetic information about the micro the, the organism. Why do we need two strands? Why not one? Mm, the replication happens before division. Why just not single stranded DNA? Hmm? No, it's accurate enough. Well, I mean, it assumes, so, double-stranded DNA is the result of evolution. So why potentially organisms with one strand, why they didn't have that evolutionary advantage, if they ever were any? Come on. I don't want to have two copies of the same thing. Backup. Just a backup. If one strand gets messed up, you can restore it based on the sequence of unaffected strand. That makes sense. That's pretty much it. Simple as that. So it's sort of a backup. Two strands. I mean, three strands would probably be even awesomer, but for some reason we have only two. And think about this. Whatever is sufficient, whatever works, and it works, works fine enough. Now, the first pressing questions. Are there any organisms that have single-stranded DNA as the genome? If you ask, are there any live organisms? The answer is no, but there are plenty of viruses that have single-stranded DNA. As, as, as the genetic material, okay? Now, another thing, uh, let's, let's uh, walk away from prokaryotes for a second and talk about eukaryotic cell. The DNA replication in eukaryotes, where does it happen? In the nucleus, great. So, 
double-stranded DNA in the nucleus is fine. Is it supposed to be in the cytoplasm? No. And that's important. DNA, is DNA ever supposed to be in the cytoplasm? No, right? It should be where? In the nucleus or mitochondria or chloroplasts, but not anywhere else. You keeping up? So, if there is double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA in the cytoplasm, that means something goes south. A lot of viruses have double-stranded DNA genome or single-stranded DNA genome. And when those genomes appear in the cytoplasm, molecules, the proteins in the cytoplasm, special receptors, they can detect the DNA and cause immune response. Make sense? There's another molecule, the biological macromolecule, that is relative, okay, that is not DNA, but close to it, which is also not supposed to be in a cytoplasm. Come on. Relative to DNA, but not DNA. RNA, okay, which RNA? Structure-wise, think about structure of RNA. What's the big difference between the... Huh? Well, ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA is, is fine. I mean, it's, it's in the ribosome anyway. What I'm saying is, structure of the DNA in the nucleus, what it is. It's double, double helix. What about RNA structure? But how many how many strands? Single stranded RNA. So single stranded RNA in a cytoplasm is normal. It's mRNA for God's sakes. Right? But if there is double stranded RNA, then something is wrong. Double stranded RNA isn't normally present in the eukaryotic cell. Does that make sense? And guess what? There are viruses that either have double-stranded RNA as the genome or produce double-stranded RNA during replication. And cell can sense it and can initiate the response. Does that make sense? Okay. Just wanted, want us to be on the same page. Now, the process that we're going to discuss, the replication, we're going to use prokaryotes as an example. The process is fairly conservative between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, which means, you know, that's, it's pretty similar. Okay? That makes sense? Good? We're fine? Um, again, once you know the basic idea of replication, you can... get some more reading or something so I will try to be fairly simple we're going to take a break now and after the break we're going to review the functions of the replication enzymes and the entire process of the replication